So this is our last poll for the day. Um, what is an important achievement for the arts and culture in the next four years? A cultural center in each neighborhood and international arts events like South by Southwest based in Boston, permanent affordable housing and art making spaces, access for every child to affordable and high quality arts education, a li living wage policy for artists, arts, <laughs> arts specialists in every city department, and a platform for the um, arts community to regularly convene. I'm really nervous, but my name is Mary Hopkins. Um, I'm an OFD, originally from Dorchester. I'm also a proud member of IATSE, which is the International Alliance of Theater and Stage Employees. And I have some, someone's here. Um, anyways, um, I paint <coughs> sets. I work on film and TV here in the city of Boston. I'm really nervous. Um, I became a member in 1991, and I didn't get my first job until 1993. So, uh, I, but I'm very glad that I have hung in there, and now it is 2014, and uh, there's a lot more work here now in the city of Boston. I don't have to travel all of New England. I can stay home. Um, <laughs> But there are things that I like to see. Personally, I'm a high school graduate, but I'm also a graduate of Mayor Ray Flynn's very first cycle of women in the building trades. And uh, which was a very important program for, for me anyways. So that got me involved, or how to get a union job, and then Okay, and then how to get a job in the film industry while well, I became a member of the union. Um, but we all work, union, non-union, low budget, no budget. Um, if we, we're not on a gig, we're freelancing, and, uh, and we're here, and we're not going anywhere. We're, it seems like we're invisible. Everyone's talking about space, just so I can throw these out quickly. The uh, film Heat, we did inside the Herald Travel Building, just torn down. Um, American Hustle was filmed entirely here, the city of Boston, Worcester, Chelsea. Um, and then at the end, and you get reading the credits, special thanks to Mayor's Office, the city of New York. There was only two days of work done there. We're here, we do the work. We're not going anywhere. So the bottom line is tax credits or no tax credits, union or non-union, the city hall needs a specific film and television office and, and, and make this type of work, like someone like myself, not the, in, 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 the odd one, that I don't have a college degree or that I'm not coming from with a theater background, that I came from a labor background and I'm blessed to earn a living wage and do this work. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Ian Thal. I am a journalist and critic who writes for the Arts Fuse and the Clyde Fitch Report. And I am also community editor for the Jewish, the former community editor for the Jewish Advocate. I'm also playwright, poet, and teaching artist specializing in physical theater. On February 14th, 2013, a number of experienced teaching artists, including myself, were asked by the City Center to provide free content for a February 23rd, 2013 Arts Festival at the Dudley Branch Library. I had had no prior relationship with the City Center beyond having repeatedly submitted my resume to the Education Department over a period of several years. <laughs> Let me reiterate, there was neither an offer of an honorarium nor in-kind services. I declined because this request for free labor went against the recommended labor practices advocated by state agencies, including the Mass Cultural Council. The City Center is not a cash strap organization. According to the most recent tax forms that were available to me, 2010, at the time, their end of the year net assets totaled $35,586,107. <laughs> their top five compensated staff members received a total of 
$224,307 a year. Additionally, Nathan Pussy, an officer of Citibank, was compensated $1,685,240 for undefined services. Even his LinkedIn in the profile was silent on what he had done to earn this. In short, the city center had 2,909,547 reasons to ask artists for free labor. <laughs> I request that the city review the labor practices of organizations with which it contracts for arts programs. <laughs> I'm a self-taught poet and painter and photographer. Uh, at 26, I've worked with Art Street. I've also taught at Corvid College a class called Street Art 10. Um, I want to discuss real quick the positives and negatives of what I've observed in my students. Uh, the positives is that excuse me, uh, local citizens find guidance to band together and to collaborate in ways to beautify the city. And the negative is that the city hasn't prepared itself to embrace the pursuits of visionary artists. Uh, it's been documented in cities across the globe that decriminalizing graffiti is a wonderful and successful campaign uniting neighborhoods, dissolving crime, and the visual aesthetics are absolutely breathtaking. Uh, I know I said a very intimidating word right now in front of all you <laughs> very fine and respectable people in the room. Um, <laughs> And I want to bring it up now um, that the idea of decriminalizing, of decriminalizing graffiti is the dream that you're looking for. Uh, it's the future uh, and the action plan is low to no cost. It starts with the exist within the existing law, and it starts with uh, well, with cooperate with cooperating and respecting the land. Uh, landowners possess this most valuable and sought out asset. Uh, the walls and streets of Boston have historically provided stability for economic growth, and they can do the same thing for the arts. Um, so we're here looking for Boston strong leaders to work uh, towards a, vis a visible production that would, be re that would be realized internationally, and would, I wrote this like standing up there, <laughs> um, and would most definitely make Boston a better place to live. So, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Alexandra Caparelli. I'm from Alston. Um, my perspective is informed by my jobs as a seamstress for both the Boston Ballet. I'm a tutu smith. And uh, I also work for um, an independent fiber artist at Midway Studios, Amy Nguyen um, Designs. And also, because I live in Alston, I was once what I like to call a low-budget rock star. Um, let's be clear. Funding the arts creates jobs. And as many times has said today, what brings us here are matters of labor and real estate. I'm talking about having a place to be, and therefore having the ability to grow. Making art is a daily action. And musically speaking, Boston has long been known among bands around the country to be an exciting destination because it's an incubator for so many kinds of music. And this is a precious part of Boston's character. It tangibly builds a community. So there needs to be room for the underground. We have even fewer places. <laughs> We have fewer places, ever fewer places, to play independent shows. We see practice in studio spaces, not to mention affordable housing, be torn up to make impossibly luxurious apartments. Artists struggle to make ends meet while fulfilling their work. And additionally, the territory is inhospi inhospitable to younger people, worsening the effects of a youth culture built around socializing at the mall and worshiping screens. In a way, young folks also have no place to go. So you have to make it easier to have all ages shows. You work with the independent event bookers. You work with the Boston Herald. You ask the Dig Boston, the very newspaper that gave Marty Walsh a winning endorsement. And I also work, and also the, the artist that I work for at Fort Point. I think that she is doing a good, like she's a good citizen. She's created four jobs for, you know, me and my, one of my former bandmates. She wants to be a good, like, boss, but she's afraid that she won't be able to keep these jobs. Um, 
They do call us the hub in this city after all. Um, I would like to say also that I'm grateful so far for the soon to be extended MBTA service, um, the public art projects, the music festivals this summer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Tibbetts. Uh, I am also, also from Alston and I'm a musician. Uh, I moved to Boston a few months before the Avalon closed, and since then I have just seen the venues that uh, my friends' bands and bands that I wanted to see from other places play just keep closing. Um, and with the news recently that the Middle East in Cambridge may be shutting down in the next couple of years. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, I'm, I've, I've been looking at what's left. And unfortunately, most of the major venues left in Boston are not venues that support local musicians. Uh, they bring in an outside band or two that plays for an hour and a half, and then the show's over at 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Uh, I have seen the shows ending very early lately, um, in the past year and a half. And the, the bars and smaller venues that do support local bands are now becoming inundated with more and more people trying to find a place to have a show. Uh, we recently contacted, my band recently contacted a band uh, in all, or recently contacted a bar in Alston, and they're booked out for nine months with shows every day of the week. Um, so Boston is becoming less of a place that has its own musical identity uh, and more of a place that's importing it from, from out of state. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is David Vieira. I'm the president of the Citywide Friends of the Boston Public Library. And I'd like to say welcome to your library. Thank you all for being here today. On April 9, 2010, the Board of Trustees of the Boston Public Library sat on this stage and voted to close four of our branch libraries. And in the course of the next four months, operating with the coalition up on Beacon Hill and in City Hall, including then State Representative Marty Walsh, we turned that vote around and those four libraries remained open. Please don't make us fight for our libraries again. There's 24 branch libraries throughout our city today that are still open, but they're locked down from the second Saturday in June to the second Saturday in September, a vital time when our communities need to have a space to gather for the arts and for other things. These spaces are closed up to everybody in this room. And those of you who have performed in public library venues know that we are open and welcoming and we're ready to receive you anytime that we have a space that's open for you. This particular building is also locked down on Sundays from the last Sunday in, eight, in May, which would be Labor Day, till the first Sunday in October. I don't know of any other major library that has its major venue closed on a Sunday. We need to do something to fund this. The Boston Public Library budget is about 6% of the city's budget. And we really need to look to see public libraries expanded through the summer months. I would also like to applaud my friends from Chinatown Eight years ago, I testified in front of the city council that I wasn't willing to advocate for a branch library in any one neighborhood, but I would advocate for branch libraries in all neighborhoods. David. And that includes our friends in Chinatown. David, thank you for your time. Thank today. you very much.
Good morning, my name is David Landingle. Um, I'm a junior at West Roxbury Academy, and I'm here not only to represent my organization, Sociedad Latina, but all community-based programs, community art-based programs in Boston. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you guys on behalf of the youth of Boston, because we usually don't get a voice like that, and we, we usually don't ever get to show that we actually do care about these programs and that these programs do help. My experience in these art-based programs have been life-changing. It provided me with so many skills and tools for my life, like in many aspects of my life. And I came in as a troubled teen whether I wanted to admit it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Community-based programs gave me another way to, to express myself other than going out and doing negative things because I didn't really have anybody to like keep me on. I have parents, but like they, they work a lot, and so I, I never really had anybody to put me on the right track or tell me what to do after school and stuff. So um, this pro like programs like this showed me that I, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just a little nervous myself. Uh, <laughs> programs like this um, help me understand that it's better to, to know that you're doing better than that than to have other people notice that you are doing better. And um, I feel like these programs help because it, it like takes away the violence off the streets because youth are more focused on doing good things. So when they're focused on doing more good things, they're prone to make more right decisions in everyday situations, which I, which I feel is, is good. And like people at these programs show a true connection. They, they make it feel like it's not a job or, or a little program. They make it feel like it's a family almost. So, I don't know, I, I really feel like they've given me a lot of support and they bring unity to the, to the community. So, that's, thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Soli Angel Vasquez. I'm a city student from West Roxbury Academy. If you could just step down one step, that would be great, thanks. And um, I'm also a youth music ambassador at Social Latino. Uh, I'm here to talk about the importance of arts programs. Music, just, music isn't just a few songs, but provides a lifeline to youth who want more meaning in their lives through awakening our creative side and providing confidence and self-esteem for all youth in Boston. Um, I've been in foster care for a very long time and had very low self-esteem, um, anxious to know if I'll fit in society, but my program has given me very, has, I'm also nervous, sorry has given me a lot of self-esteem. Um, Community-based arts program have opened up a whole new world of view, has introduced me to many youth similar to me. It has developed in me a, ver a variety of skills such as being collaborative, patient, responsible, organized, and very open-minded. So I that other arts programs should be funded in a way that sustains the programs itself and all the individuals involved. Arts and music has impacted in my life tremendously. In the midst of all my personal struggles, through my involvement with this program has been changed, has has been changed. And I know others' lives has been changed as well. It has impacted in the community by bringing us as a whole, prevent less violence, and bring more opportunity to our community. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly. On behalf of Boston University, I'd like to thank the mayor for his commitment to the arts and for you for listening. I serve as the managing director of the BU Arts Initiative, which is a new position in the office of the provost. The creation of the arts initiative as a priority demonstrates our commitment to the critical role of the arts in the intellectual and personal development of our more than 30,000 students in Boston. <laughs> BU has a strong history in the arts. For over 60 years, we have been training some of the world's finest musicians, poets, theater artists, and more. We proudly partner with many local arts organizations, including the Celebrity Series with the Street Pianos and Boston Calling Music Festival. We provide our, all of our students memberships to the BSO, the MFA, and the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum. In any given week on our campus, there are over two dozen arts events that happen, and virtually all of them are free and open to the public, drawing thousands of people to the area. Over the decades, BU has truly transformed the former Auto Row and the Commonwealth Avenue to a vibrant cultural sector, and we have only just begun. We are looking forward to partnering with the Walsh administration and offering our resources to keeping the Innovation District model, 
while firmly positioning artists as a high priority within that framework. Implementing a Mayor's Arts Council that includes arts leaders from colleges and universities where we can participate in discussions around supporting, sharing, and benefiting from the cultural assets of the cities and our institutions, and dreaming up new ways to partner and support the development of new <coughs> art spaces in Boston that will make our region even more culturally vibrant. Thank you. So I just want to recognize Trinity as our last um, testifier, testifier today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for adding me. I want to make sure that the hip hop voice was heard today. So my name is Cindy Diggs and I'm the founder of Peace Boston, which is a hip hop peace movement that we started back in 2005 with members of the former uh, music industry. When the industry began to crash, those of us who worked in it in the 90s decided to give our experiences to the young people and that's where hip hop was created to stop the violence back in 1973. And when put in the proper hands, it can be done again. We have so many people that use hip hop for negative um, means and we see people using it for commercials to sell cars and we want to use it to save lives. Right on. One of the things that we've always had a problem with is space because everyone fears us. But it's something that if you have those of us who are the leaders, there's nothing to fear. I was asked to be a part of the, actually asked to form Mayor Menino's Hip Hop Roundtable, and we helped to put on the Peace Boston Hip Hop Festival for many years at Government Center until they took it away from those of us in the hip hop culture and brought in people from the suburbs to put it on, and then there was violence um, that pursued because they brought in young artists rather than bringing old school because the young people love old school as well, and their parents are there, and they're not going to act up then. So, the one thing that I would like to see happen with the arts is that we have more art space and there are 35 Boston Centers for um, Youth and Families that are underutilized where we could have simultaneous talent shows that are happening so that kids aren't coming to the one talent show that's put on by people in the industry so that we can have a lot less violence because imagine never being able to dance or perform because you're a young person and now these young people put on their own events in their own houses and that's when the violence starts. So if you'd like to support our efforts, we just started the Peace Collaborative and we have a fundraiser on March 1st. We're bringing Mardi Gras to Boston to the Harborside Inn Lounge. So join us there. We're going to build a youth activities fund and support the youth in hip hop. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, we've, we've gone so far over time. One, I just want to thank everybody for their time, um, your passion, um, and please uh, stay involved with this process. Um, uh, if you didn't give us your emails when you signed in, please do that so we can make sure um, that we know how to contact you. Um, I'll also give a shout out to Matt Wilson at Mass Creative. Please sign up with him. know what's going on in the arts community. Um, here's our final poll. If you did not have an opportunity to testify, um, if you have more to say, um, you can feel free to give us your testimony in writing. Um, we'll be here for a couple minutes afterwards. We can have another meeting after this, but please talk to us individually as well. So thank you again for your time, and uh, have a good day.